few nights ago, I was thinking about my TED talk and I realized how uncatchy my subtitle was. Therefore, I took the creative license to insert the second subtitle. My name is Putuliza Kusuma Mustika, but you can call me Icha. I am a cetologist, a whale and dolphin scientist from Indonesia. And if you don't recognize this reference yet, I hope in the next few slides you will. I was born and grew up in a city called Yogyakarta in Indonesia. I did not want to be a marine biologist, let alone a marine mammal scientist right away. But it's true that the dream came quite early in my life. Namely, when I was in high school, when I saw a drawing of a dolphin in my high school uh, English book, just like this cartoon, not quite, but similar to this one. I remember asking my teacher about marine biology in Indonesia, and he said, Indonesia doesn't have a marine scientist yet. So I said to myself, well, I'll be the first one. Now, back in 90, the early 90s, there was no internet. So it was quite hard for me to obtain information about which university to enroll if I want to be a marine biologist. I decided to enroll in the Bogor Agricultural University. And that was really because uh, it was one of the very few universities that had marine, mammal, uh, marine biology subject. Turns out I was not the first marine biologist in Indonesia, but it was actually great because I can then learn from my lecturers and my seniors about marine biology. I learned, about, I, I learned how to dive and I joined a faculty diving club and conducted a scientific diving expedition in East Indonesia. After I graduated, I joined WWF Indonesia for their sea turtle conservation project for about six years. Now, this scene is a scene from The Voyage Home, a Star Trek movie also known as The One with the Whales where Captain Kirk, Spock, and their friends went back in time to retrieve a pair of humpback whales from the 1980s Earth and bring the whales back to the 23rd century to prevent a planetary climate disaster. The movie was released in December 86, while earlier that year, a ban on whaling was actually in effect worldwide. It was not my first Star Trek movie, but I kept hearing about it. The Voyage Home was poignant in a sense that it really establishes my inexplicable feeling of wanting to get involved with uh, whale conservation. It reminded me about the dolphin drawing which I saw in high school. It reminded me of my dream to study the marine mammals. Thus, in 2002, after working for almost six years in WWF Indonesia, I decided to go back to uni for my master's and subsequently PhD. I went back to school to James Cook University in Australia. My master's was about the traditional whaling in La Malera, East Nusa Tenggara, Indonesia with Professor Helene Marsh, Dr. Alison Cottrell and Dr. Ivan Lawler. My PhD was about the sustainability of dolphin watching industry in Bali again with Professor Helene Marsh and Dr. Alastair Bertels. In December 2011, I received my PhD and thus I unofficially joined the ranks of Dr. Daniel Krepp, uh, Dr. Daniel Krepp from uh, RASI Foundation and Dr. Benjamin Khan of Apex Environmental as one of the very few uh, cetologists working in Indonesia. After my PhD, I worked with Conservation International uh, in Bali for their Marine Protected Area Network. However, because I always wanted to go back doing whale and dolphin research, after one and a half years in CI, I left to be an independent researcher. Nevertheless, I learned a lot during my short stay with CI, to say the least the importance of an MPA network in managing marine migratory species and how big a mismatch is the general MPA design in Indonesia for marine mammals. Now you might start thinking, when am I going to start more talking more about cetacean governance in Indonesia and less about the background of my career? It's coming right about now. My first self-appointed uh, job as an independent cetologist, that is whale and dolphin scientist, as we'd like to call ourselves, is to fix the stranding data in Indonesia. 
back in the late uh, 2012 when I decided to be an independent cytologist, there was some idea of displaying the whale stranding data online. My colleagues uh, Aditya Setiawan and I have been curating data from stranding data from 2004 with records dating back a good few years beforehand. Hence, we had a handful of data available for display already. In October 2012, we had a mass stranding of about 50 short fin pilot whales on Sabu Raijua in East Indonesia. That event was the start of the establishment of a stranding network in Indonesia. This, uh, the next year, I was one of the five uh, Indonesians uh, invited to a regional stranding workshop and training in the Philippines. Ocean Park Hong Kong, University of St. Andrews and Ocean Adventure trained as well for in that workshop. It was an indeed a step as a steep learning curve to understand the stranding issues for me. So that year 2013 was a busy year, spent mostly building the stranding network in Indonesia with many people, uh, notably the Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries. Looking back, 2012, 2013 was really when we started to really get serious with the marine mammal governance in Indonesia. Later in mid 2015, with a group of friends, I co-established the second marine mammal NGO in Indonesia called the Cetaci, the Cetacean Cyrenian Indonesia. Now, the subtitle of my talk today is Building the Nation's Data-Driven Cetacean Governance. But when I started my journey as an Indonesian cytologist, I was certainly not thinking about the lack of data in Indonesia. To be honest, I just wanted to play with the whales and dolphins. Yet, as I went deeper and deeper into the marine conservation world in Indonesia, I realized we lacked two very important things. We lacked data and or we lacked the ability to put meaning into data. We definitely cannot make elementary analysis on many cases because of the lack of data. Humor me for a bit and let me bring you back to Star Trek. By now you would have realized that I love Star Trek. Don't get me wrong, I love Star Wars too, particularly the resistance spirit it brings. However, assuming and hoping that we can all be free to choose and embrace our wildest dreams, we still need to build and mend bridges. We need to foster understanding and appreciation of ourselves, of nature, and of other cultures. I learned those from Star Trek. There is also one thing that I learned from binding the Star Trek Next Generation in Netflix, and that is the importance of data. Commander Data of the USS Enterprise is my all-time favorite Star Trek character. He is an android not the mobile phone operating system. This Android actually predates the Android OS and comes with unlimited data. However, despite being an Android, data wants to be human. But most importantly for our story today, commander data embodies an expanse of knowledge available to humankind. Data is also a character who always meticulously analyzes a situation and he would refrain from drawing a conclusion from insufficient data. However, whenever Captain Picard asked him to speculate, if he can, data would speculate as well to the best of his knowledge, based on limited information and based on references from other situations. In this sense, what data is doing is exactly what a good scientist should be doing. Collect sufficient information, analyze the information and make suggestions or even predictions based on this information. And when the information is limited, well, we just have to collect more data, whatever data we can get. Now let's get back to the conservation realm. An example of conservation governance in Indonesia that generally is not yet data-driven is the design of marine protected areas. Traditionally, MPAs are designed to protect sedentary species or communities like coral reefs, uh, seagrass or mangroves, instead of protecting moving animals. However, marine migratory species such as whales, dolphins, sea turtles, sharks, rays, dugongs, can also use some portions of the habitats protected by the MPAs. In Indonesia, these animals can be very underrepresented in the MPA design. We call it with the fancy name of MPA design mismatch. 
An example of this mismatch is the design of the Lovina MPA in North Bali. This map shows the predicted habitat of spinner dolphins in Lovina made, my, made by my colleague Iqbal Herwataputra. The black rather solid line here is the boundaries of the Lovina MPA. The dark green pixels are the predicted habitats of the spinner dolphins based on the sightings I recorded during my PhD. As you can see here, there is a mismatch between MPA boundaries and the habitats of the species the MPA intends to protect. This is a classic example of a mismatch in Indonesia, something that we need to fix. Data unavailability can also come as a result of cultural misunderstanding. This issue was illustrated when four Kufiers picked whales stranded at four locations along North Bali in 2015. At that time, we have the necropsy team already trained in Bali, but the locals did not let the vet team to conduct the necropsy. The reason was because they felt it was a disrespect to the animal. As you can see here on the right hand side, the locals actually perform a simple religious ceremony out of respect to the animals. A few weeks later, we, the misunderstanding was ironed out, but we have passed the critical time when any reliable data could have been collected. Nevertheless, as of late, the Indonesian government have started to understand the importance of properly collecting and analyzing data. The latest case that I can present here is another Kufir speak whale that was found dead in Sanur Bali um, last May. Led by my colleagues Jaya Rata and Deni Rahmadani DVMs, the team found used fishing lines inside of the animal's stomach. They also found that the animal's stomach and intestines were rather empty. The current analysis suggests that the animal might have stranded due to its weakened condition due to malnutrition. Another example of our current effort in understanding data is the stranding hotspot analysis. So far, we have around 580 stranding data points in Indonesia, which hopefully is enough to analyze where and when the animals usually stranded in Indonesia. We call it the spatial and temporal hotspot analysis of the stranding locations. We hope to find factors that might be linked to these stranding events. We also hope to backtrack and do some drift modeling to know where approximately some of these strandings originated in the ocean, the point of origin or the crime scenes, if you will. Coming back to full circle, I am also hoping to return to Saburai Jua, the island that started the stranding network in Indonesia this October, COVID permitted, for boat survey and oceanographic analysis to understand the whale and dolphin abundance in those areas and the stranding prevalence of the species. I am going to conduct this uh, study with my colleagues at Reef Check Indonesia, and we would like to thank uh, the CORMAP for providing us with the funding. But Indonesia is a big country. I cannot conserve the marine mammals in this country alone, and I don't intend to do that. I am now part of a larger network of emerging scientists, NGOs, universities, government institutions interested in this taxa. We still have a long way to go to boldly go where the giants have gone before. The great overseas scientists in the marine mammal world. However, at least we have now made a start. Bearing in mind that no conservation effort is ever solid without a solid set of data and a rigorous discipline in interpreting it. I hope that the scientists and the institutions in Indonesia are heading to the right direction to conserve these beautiful creatures for our own future. Thank you.